Hey, I have come to writing the document in description because, like many, I felt that Battlefield was increasingly random. But I couldn't exactly pinpoint how to rigorously define what is randomness, which is a very common topic these days among YouTubers and players, and how the game mechanics had, in the end, the effect of increasing this randomness. For example, it seemed obvious to anyone with what I call competitive dispositions that the Battlefield 1 barrel smoke uh, is a typical case of a random inducing mechanic. It seemed clear that the creation uh, of a cloud of smoke that hinders the vision of both players in a 1 versus 1 uh, will not increase, will not lead to the increase of a skill gap. Uh, it will not trigger among players any skill based behavior but rather level out the dexterity levels between two adversaries, since the concrete response to this mechanic is usually shaking the mouse over the general direction of the enemy. I checked my records, I checked other people's uses of the game, how they respond to this mechanic, and the most common reaction to this mechanic, the most common adaptation to this mechanic, is shaking the mouse, which cannot be considered as uh, mechanic inducing uh, behaviors with a high skill setting. Uh, my question was, can you build a model for randomness or lack of skill gap? Or, on the contrary, do you need constant observation of the player's reaction to a mechanic to verify if it does or doesn't increase the randomness of the game overall? And if so, how can you foresee the effect of a new game mechanic on the gameplay of a community. How can you get an idea of what's likely to happen after you introduce a mechanic in a given game, in my example Battlefield 1? Since listening to me is something I suspect you enjoy as little as I do, and since the subject is probably not something that would be of high interest to many people, um, I simply linked the document in the description of this video. Uh, the other solution would have been to record the whole document with my cringy French voice, but then you will mute me and watch the gameplay instead, or not watch the video at all. So we can take the following example. The situation of a very important head flinching after a headshot, like it was the case on a game like Battlefield 4 at the very start. This head flinching is such that the player's whole body randomly flinches left or right when you headshot him and he becomes extremely hard to finish with the following shots. Even if, so, even if in theory, aiming for the head in this situation would appear to be only accessible to very few good aimers with the ability to finish their enemy despite the shaking, it actually gave birth to a skill gap reducing adaptation. The players began to only shoot the body of their enemies since it was obviously safer on the long run because mechanically simpler than aiming for the head, given the hitboxes and the spread model of this game. What I want to say is that this indicates that from a very aim demanding situation, the head being extremely hard to hit when it flinches, we ended up to a very low mechanically demanding meta. There was no necessary link between the maximum possible mechanical aiming skill and the actual use that followed. The adaptation of players to the game led to have a low mechanical gap between experienced players and it did not turn these fights into a deciding uh, performative factor as a consequence. From this basic example, my answer to my original question is the following. It's most of the time after a meta is built, after observing what practices are born in reaction to a mechanic, that something can be said random in inducing or not. In other words, it's the ways of playing induced by a mechanic that creates randomness, not the mechanic itself. The question is not, is it random, but will the habits that will result from the adaptation to a given mechanic be more or less random? To sum up, most given mechanics can potentially diminish or increase the total degree of randomness of a game environment, only they won't necessarily do it directly, they will do it through the way players will appropriate or adapt to the game, through the automatisms they will create to be most effective on it. From this, my point is that the potential uses and responses to mechanic can most of the time only be foreseen 
by understanding the practical logic, the ethos of the group of players confronted with this mechanic, or by observing the reactions of other groups possessing similar profiles and set in similar situations on different games. In consequence, random inducing mechanics could be defined this way. A mechanic that doesn't give birth to a skill-based adaptation from players. Uh, this definition allows us to take the randomness outside of the mechanics and to put it in the behaviors these mechanics trigger. Mechanics are only attempts to induce a given way of playing. It's a well-established fact from a philosopher or sociologist who studied artifacts that um, artifacts possess scripts that suggest specific actions or discourage others. Uh, video games are artifacts and as such they invite or inhibite particular behaviors. Yet these invitations can be reinterpreted or ignored by players. As such, even mechanics that aim to increase the skill gap in a game and therefore lower the, the random factor can produce the opposite effect and actually induce behaviors that will reduce the use of skills mobilized on average, uh, for example in the 1 vs 1 situation. This especially applies to gameplay theory. The values of the gameplay are attempts to invite to certain gameplays or to inhibit others. If you input a high spread value with a given spread reset value to your automatic weapons, you are trying to invite players to use subtle spread control skills. However, it's only an invitation. The value of the gunplay doesn't imply necessarily a certain gameplay. Players can find gunplay techniques that will integrate the gunplay value, but in a completely different way than the one you try to force them into. In other words, it can backfire. A gunplay value is good or bad only in reference to the meta it's causing, to the practices it's causing. The adaptations prompted by the AOK spread values on Battlefield 4 are a good example. These spread values were implemented, I believe, like most of the gunplay of BF4, to trigger subtle control behaviors among players. Uh, they that would increase the skill gap and the game depth. However, on the contrary, what happened is that it led players to completely sideline the spread control because it was felt as too mechanically demanding to be successfully achieved on the long run. In practical situations, it was not interesting, or it was felt as such by players, which is the important point, to attempt to mobilize AOK -okay spread control skills, because the success ratio of correctly timing the burst will be, or was felt, as being too low. What I mean is that the practical situations factors can go against a theoretical gunplay model. Competitive BF4 ended up with a spray meta. An attempt to force bursting led players to mainly spray. It seems that increasing the mechanical abilities required to win a fight besides a, a certain point will lead to reduce the attempts to use these mechanical abilities. The previous example is a symmetrical opposite to the well-known situation where the random factor of a game increases because everyone is given low mechanical possibilities during a fight, especially in 1 vs 1 situations. The key idea is that it's only through the reactions of players that random-based mechanics are actually inducing skill-based behaviors. The question that one should ask if he wishes to make a game that tends towards this direction is what practices will arise from the particular game mechanic I'm introducing or modifying, what meta may emerge. The randomness is not in the game mechanic itself, it's in the adaptations, the playing styles that will be built around it. Games are systems, and balancing the whole system can be done through only through indicators linked to a few dimensions of the system. I heard that the people working on the gunplay on BF1 consider that their weapons are theoretically balanced in terms of pure mathematical values. Yet, this means that they are balanced in regards to a few indicators selected as relevant, but they may not be in regard to all the parameters in the game. Some of these parameters being without indicators to quantify them. For, for now. Uh, for example, what are the possible dodging movements a weapon allows, which is hard to quantify as it's, it's not only a question of speed difference, it's also a question of how it's practically felt when you play the game or the movements uh, that become possible 
Also, how the combination of aim punch, of the need or not to scope, and of the visibility compared to hip fire if you need to scope, how does all this affect in practice a player gameplay? Or is the time to kill low enough so that in practice you can handle multi target situations without dying before the, you finish the target, etc., etc.? So if you didn't find a way to quantify that and to take it into account, you can't function like if you could prove mathematically that all the parameters related to the gunplay are balanced. I'm especially thinking about how the hip fire can be abused on BF1 right now, not only with the automatico but with a lot of other weapons like uh, the M1907 uh, trench or sweeper. Because even if the hip fire's values by themselves can be balanced compared to other battlefields, the addition of these values to the possibilities of strafing that they allow in Battlefield 1 compared to the low mobility of other guns when they are scoping uh, with the visibility, with the, uh, with the lack of suppression, etc, etc. All of this, if you add all these elements, they give you, they give you a lot of unbalanced hipfire weapons because there are all these parameters that you can't always quantify. So, as obvious as it may sound, weapons are not balanced because of their statistics. Ultimately, they are balanced because of how they are used in practice. Despite all the st possible statistics of a weapon, uh, if players are using it in a certain way, is this way, is this concrete use of the weapon compared to other weapons that have to be said as balanced or not? Obviously the gunplay values are not always bad indicators. Uh, it's obvious that if I take a weapon with insanely low damages and insanely low fire rates, uh, it's highly unlikely that players can find uh, a way to change its balance. But in the case of non-extreme weapons with a lot of parameters to take into account that may not be foreseen, in that case the values are not the ultimate thing to check. In that case what matters are the uses born from the gunplay values. In this situation, you must either add new indicators or, if it appears impossible to quantify some elements of the game, work in a more ethnographic way, as I, as I suggest, by observing players' adaptations and uses a posteriori. Otherwise, working by being focused on weapons' values or game mechanics outside of their concrete use can lead to function like a bad economist, to create mathematical models that will miss the real processes in action by using too narrow indicators. Hence, the need to do what I believe has not been actively achieved on BF1, uh, which is to be focused on the behaviors born from the mechanics and not on the mechanics themselves. That's to give an example of what such an observation could look like, I did a preliminary work in the document given in description uh, in French, about what principles of behavior unite the group of players we call competitive on battlefield and how this small number of principles in, is in a state of dissonance with the architecture of battlefield. The main point is to show that the situation of dissonance or incompatibility, friction, hysteresis, as you wish, between competitive players and the architecture of battlefield is not essentially the result of an intention from the developers to prevent these uses through the design of this architecture. It's not essentially the consequence of marketing decisions aimed at targeting a, a casual audience. It results before everything of an absence of understanding from developers and from players to developers also of what constitute exactly competitive dispositions. That is to say, a lack of understanding of how the game is perceived and used by people with dispositions to uh, with dispositions to heavy and performance oriented intellectualizations of a game architecture to the unveiling and the exploiting of its mechanics to reception of the game blind or insensitive to ar to artistic dimensions etc in short the developers can hardly either oppose or validate the competitive players behaviors um, through a conscious decision, since they don't exactly grasp what these competitive dispositions are, what kind of ethos they originate from. I believe this is a situation that will have been prevented or reduced by more analysis of Battlefield's concrete uses that rely very often for a different group of players, not only competitive profiles, on a distortion and reinterpretation of some elements of the architecture of the game. 
I'm convinced that over the course of Battlefield series evolution during the last decade, some core mechanics of the game have been unintentionally deleted, because not enough work was carried out in order to understand how these mechanics were distorted by players to create their own gameplays, and how this distortion was the reason for the enthusiasm for the Battlefield franchise. I already gave examples of some elements that were lost or disregarded as relevant gameplay elements in uh, other videos, but these elements were from a competitive point of view. And what I mean in this video is that for different groups of players with a lot of different uh, relationships to the game, uh, artistic, uh, competitive, uh, uh, roleplay, etc., they these players relied on gameplay elements that may have been disregarded because no attempts, as much as I can see in the competitive case, were done to understand how their uses of the game relied on some on the distortion of some gameplay elements. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Obviously the whole document is in description. It's were more complete than this video, which was only a selection of some relevant parts of this document and also my uh, the document in French where are all the examples of what I said is in uh, also in description but uh, it's obviously in French I wanted to put it online because it's uh, something I spent time on because it was done for it's uh, as ridiculous as it may sound it's a master thesis and it actually wasn't a bad one apparently so I just wanted to put it on this channel um, Okay, I'm gonna stop here. Before I stop, um, about this channel specifically, I won't have time to play the next year and I barely touch the game the current year, so it's highly unlikely that I upload a video for a very, very long time. And I had to force myself to record the current one during the, the holidays. Uh, I wish, I deeply wish that competitive content creators will appear as soon as Battlefield has, it, if, if it ever has again, a uh, competitive scene, which is something that doesn't depend on the players anymore, but on what apparently was announced on Twitter, which is uh, them working on a competitive uh, thing, on something competitive, which will be great. Because right now, most of the people you see playing the game are uh, YouTubers or streamers with a casual oriented audience. So of course they are focusing on this audience and um, they are not trying because they have no motivation to explore the game at the maximum. They have no motivation to create a specifically interesting gameplay at all for comp from a competitive point of view. And even more, most of the talented players are not playing Battlefield 1, they are playing something else. So we have nothing. So I I'm, I'm a bit disappointed when I'm searching for content on Battlefield 1 because since right now, in terms of content that would please a uh, competitive profile, it's the game is dead. Well, that's all. Uh, see you later, hopefully. And if you need me, I'm always active on Twitter.